This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. Right, let's go through and recap the workings that you've seen from the glory days of F7, uh, but the workings from the group statement of financial position. So this is going to be the focus for the next few videos before we then move on to the statement of profit or loss and OCI uh, a little bit later on. Okay, so uh, when you're looking at the workings, obviously the first working that you have there is your group structure. Uh, with a simple group structure such as this here, parent, subsidiary and then an associate, I wouldn't necessarily bother about putting in the group structure. Okay, As it gets more complicated when you start to look at complex group structures, when you begin to look at changes in ownership of group structures, then yes, by all means, you will need to consider drawing up a group structure. Okay, However, here, I wouldn't worry about it too much. The only thing I, I would add to your notes is that do go through that and always check whether or not it is a, a mid-year acquisition. Okay, so you want to go through there and, and, and have a look uh, at whether or not the subsidiary was acquired mid-year because if that's the case, you might need to try and work out what you have, don't you, with regards to the retained earnings at acquisition. Okay. Uh, the other thing that you go through and do as well, if you so wish, is to work out what the non-controlling interest is. Okay, so if you have seventy-five percent of a sub, uh, then you have a twenty-five percent NC. I remember the associate. There is no non-controlling interest. Okay, it's so frustrating if you mark P two papers to see at this level students referring to non-controlling interest of an associate. No, yeah, we don't have control of an associate, do we? Yeah, we only have influence, so there is no non-controlling interest. You can only have non-controlling interest if you have control, okay? Uh, so that's the non-controlling interest, isn't it, of the sub, okay? I will put that in. If I ever see you talking about non-controlling interest with relation to the associate, I shall hunt you down, okay? Uh, then what we've got is going through there and looking at the net assets working. The net assets working is vitally, vitally, vitally important. Okay, uh, it's fundamental. So what you've got there, remember you look at the net assets of the subsidiary. So you look at the reporting dates. So you take that, don't we, from is it S's SFP? Don't we? So you've got your equity shares, share premium, retained earnings. So remember, when we're looking at the net assets, we, we look at the equity section, don't we? Uh, your equity shares, and is it your share premium? Even at this level, surprise, surprise, do not change from the reporting date to the acquisition date. Okay. Uh, you then need to work out the retained earnings at acquisition. Usually that will be given to you within the question. On the very rare occasion, you might need to work it out. Uh, if there has been a mid-year acquisition. But from what we've seen in the, the, the many P2 exams that have been set now is that the retained earnings acquisition are usually given to you. OK, uh, you've then just got bits and pieces. Remember, uh, you've got a provision for unrealized profit adjustment to make uh, in S's net assets if S is the seller. OK, uh, remember that goes in there at the reporting date, doesn't it? And again, we'll talk about fair value adjustments to do with property, plant and equipment and, and other situations that you see, such as maybe contingent liabilities. But the key bit is that you, if you have a fair value adjustment, you adjust for it at acquisition and also at the reporting date. OK, uh, and again, that may be different uh, to the reporting date to what it was at acquisition. So do read the question very, very carefully. Again, just be careful, whatever adjustment you, you have there in working to your net assets, whether it's a PUP, whether it's a fair value adjustment, don't forget to also make the other side of the entry in the group statement of financial position. Okay, If you adjust there in working number two, your net assets, you also need to adjust in the group statement of financial position. So with your PUP, you would need to adjust your inventory. If the fair value was to do with PPE, then you would need to adjust your PPE as well. OK, so bear that in mind. It's very important. You, know, you score the marks when you put the numbers into the group accounts. Not much for the working, particularly in working too. 
Uh, you then have the next working, which is there, is it working number three, which is there is your goodwill. Again, this is a hugely important mark scoring area uh, within the exam. You don't get many marks in terms of the net assets of the sub. Uh, that's just to help you with other calculations. You do get lots of marks in terms of your goodwill. OK, so, so hopefully you can remember the, the, the working. So remember, you take the fair value of the consideration. Again, even at this level, it tends just to be cash. Uh, but don't forget, you, you could have shares or loan stock. So we'll touch upon that later on. Uh, the non-controlling interest at acquisition. 99% uh, of the times you see it at fair value. But don't forget, it could also be based upon your proportionate share of net assets method. Uh, and then you deduct the net assets at the date of acquisition. So whatever figure you have here in working two, that figure is then deducted uh, from your goodwill calculation, isn't it? Okay. Uh, that gives you the goodwill acquisition. And remember, if you've got your fair value method of measuring the non-controlling interest, then your goodwill is referred to as the full goodwill, isn't it? Because that goodwill that will have is it your controlling interest share of the goodwill and also the non controlling interest. So the controlling interest is effectively P's goodwill, and the non controlling interest goodwill on top of that then gives you the full goodwill, doesn't it? Okay. Uh, you then deduct any impairments, remember. It's your impairments to date, isn't it? So it's cumulative on the statement of financial position because it shows everything that is existing as at that point in time. So you need to look at every impairment that there's been since the date of acquisition. And then that gives you your carrying value, doesn't it? So that figure that you have there at the bottom, that needs to appear on the group statement of financial position, doesn't it, within your non-current assets. OK, uh, everybody happy there with your goodwill calculation. Learn it. If you don't learn it, you're just learning to fail, essentially. OK, and we don't want that. Uh, working number four is your non-controlling interest. So your non-controlling interest takes the non-controlling interest at acquisition. OK, uh, so that figure there. So I will put that in that black box there. Remember, that is the same figure, isn't it, as your non-controlling interest? that you have in your goodwill, OK? Uh, so those two figures are, are exactly the same, OK? Uh, you then go through there and add on the non-controlling interest share of S's post-acquisition profits to date, OK? So that's your figure from working to. Please show that calculation. Don't put the number in on your calculator and throw it in. You need to show how you've calculated it. So by that, what we're saying is that you need to go through there and take this number here. And then that number, as we will see, will go into two places. First of all, as we're discussing here, we're talking about working number four. So you are going to take the non-controlling interest share of that post-acquisition movement in net assets figure into the NCI, Okay, taking the NCI share. Again, just be careful. You then deduct the non-controlling interest share of any impairment to date. But remember, you only do that if your NCI is at fair value. So if you are using the full goodwill method, yeah, because if you're using the full goodwill method, then that goodwill represents the controlling interest of the parent share and also the non-controlling interest of the goodwill. So if we've impaired the goodwill, we need to give the non-controlling interest their share of it. If we've gone through there and used the proportionate share of net assets method to value the NCI, then the goodwill that we have is just the parent share only. So if there is an impairment in the goodwill, we are just impairing the parent's goodwill. So therefore, there is no reason then to allocate any of the impairment to the non-controlling interest because we haven't shown the non-controlling interest goodwill in the goodwill calculation okay so, so do just be aware however most of the time like i said 99 percent of the time the nci is based on the full goodwill method using the non-controlling interest at fair value okay so you'd be glad to know about that uh your group retained earnings whoa there's a lot going on in there isn't there 
Again, this is another huge mark scoring area within the exam. Okay. Uh, so you put in 100% of the parents' retained earnings, nice and straightforward. Sorry to say, you're not going to get any marks for that within the exam. A little bit harsh, but there you go. What can you do? Uh, and then you add on your share of S's post-acquisition profits. So those post-acquisition profits that you've seen them working to, you now add in our share. Uh, we also go through as well uh, and deduct our share of any impairment to date. Okay. Uh, again, remember, uh, you take your share of the impairment if the non-controlling interest is at fair value. So again, if we've used the full method of valuing the goodwill, we take P share okay, of that impairment. If the proportionate share of net assets has been used, then we just take the impairment in full. Okay, uh, There's no need to take P share of it because we haven't allocated any goodwill to the NCI using the proportionate share of net assets method to value the NCI. Whoa! All sounds a little bit confusing, doesn't it? We'll see it working through the examples as we go along. Okay. Uh, again, if you've got a pup, uh, if P is the seller, then you are going to adjust P's retained earnings. And again, don't forget to adjust the group inventory as well. And then the other two bits and pieces that you've got essentially are, are related to impairments or sorry, are related to your associates. Uh, so before we do that, uh, let's look at working six. So you've got your investment and associates. So if you have influence, you have the power to direct. We are equity, sorry, the power to participate, getting carried away there. If you have the power to participate. You have, is it an associate that you will equity account for? You will equity account for it by showing one line item in the statement of financial position which is referred to as your investment and associate. So you've got PPE, goodwill, investment and associate. Okay. Uh, you take your cost, to which you then add on our share of A's post-acquisition profit. So you'll need to calculate the post-acquisition profits, looking at the, the retained earnings at acquisition and the retained earnings at year end and looking at the movement. Okay. Uh, P share. So in that earlier example, you would use 19.9%. Uh, but within question one, you only ever have somewhere between 20 and 50 percent. OK, so if you're in 30 percent, put in 30 percent of the post acquisition profits. OK, uh, and then you have the, as well your impairment to date. Again, it's the impairment to date. So an accumulation of all the impairments since the date of acquisition and make sure that it's vitally, 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 vitally important. You just put in 100% of that impairment. Don't take our share because as we'll see in a later video, when the impairment is calculated, the calculations have already taken into account our percentage ownership. So that impairment that you're given just relates to our percentage ownership. So there's no need to take 30% of it. Whatever the impairment is that's given within the question, throw it in. Okay. Uh, no percentage adjustments. Got that? Sure. Excellent. Okay. Uh, again, the next bit is just essentially thinking about double entry. So what you've got there is you've adjusted the top of the statement of financial position of your assets by the share of the post acquisition profits and by any impairment. So if you've adjusted the asset to the top, something else needs to be adjusted, doesn't it, to make it balance? So that's whereby you go through there, don't we? And adjust for the same figure within working five for the post acquisition profits and also as well uh, the impairment. OK, so whatever figures you've got in working six for your share of the post acquisition profits of the associate, put that in working five as well. And for any impairment of the associate, again, put that in working number five as well. OK. Excellent. If you're curious as to how the marks tend to work, uh, it tends to be one mark for, for every number that you put in. OK, so there's 35 marks with regards to the group accounts uh, in order to get a pass. Technically, you need 17 and a half marks. You need 18 marks. You need 18 numbers correct to be able to pass the group accounts. But don't worry about that. You'll be scoring much higher than 18 come the real exam with regards to group accounts. OK. Uh, so what we're then going to go through and move on to look at, having looked at the workings 
is we've just got there the adjustments between the group and the subsidiary because that's where the, the majority of the, the, the workings are going to be. Okay, I'm just going to quickly run through them. Shouldn't be too difficult. Uh, hopefully you will be able to remember all of them from the past. Okay, uh, intracompany balances. Uh, remember, if you have intracompany balances, you need to remove the payable and remove the receivable. So essentially what you're going through there is that you are debiting your payable, aren't we? And we are also going through that and then crediting the receivable. Nice and straightforward. OK, the same would happen if it was any intracompany loan as well. OK, you would remove the investment asset and you would remove the loan liability. OK, but what we've seen in F7 is intracompany uh, receivables, intracompany payables or remove them. OK, uh, however, what happens if those intracompany balances are not equal? You have cash in transit. Uh, so before you remove the intracompany balances, you need to deal with the cash in transit first. So don't think about it as cash in transit. Just think about it as a cash receipt from a normal credit customer. OK, so what you have there, if it's a cash receipt from a normal credit customer, you just debit your bank. and then credit your receivable okay so you're increasing the bank balance and you are reducing the receivable balance by the amount of cash in transit okay you'll be told how much cash is in transit within the question once you've done that it's then nice and straightforward you then just remove the intra-group balances so adjust the equal receivable and payable balance like we did a moment ago in terms of the intracompany balance uh, then you've got your inventory in transit. Uh, I've never seen it in P2. I think it appeared once, was it? Uh, a long time ago within the F7 exam. It caused all sorts of nightmares uh, within the exam. I think hardly anybody got it right. No surprise, because no one had ever seen it before. Uh, but if you have inventory in transit, uh, that then essentially you you bought the goods but you haven't received them and because you've not received them you haven't recorded them uh so the this inventory you're receiving from the subsidiary and it's sat on a boat uh somewhere way out uh, in the atlantic ocean okay and it's on its way to you okay if that's the case you need to record the inventory in transit so you need to debit the inventory uh, so increasing the inventory there and then what you need to do as well is you need to credit the payables okay essentially it's like a credit purchase isn't it debit purchases credit payables but because we are looking at it from an sfp perspective you debit the inventory and credit the payables okay uh, also just be careful uh, there could also be a provision for unrealized profit adjustment as well because if those goods have been sold to you uh, at a profit Obviously, those goods haven't been realised outside of the group because they're on their way to you. Uh, so they can't have been sold outside of the group. So there could also be a pup adjustment as well as adjusting for the inventory in transit. <sighs> yeah, that's nasty, isn't it? But but there we go. Uh, moving onwards and moving upwards. OK, uh, we then go through, I think, if memory serves me right, uh, and look separately at your unrealised profits. OK. Uh, again, the most common one that we've got there is your inventory unrealized profit. So again, you need to remove the intragroup profit on inventory that is held at year end. So remember, we're going to go through there and use your cost structures. Is it there a markup or a margin to work out the profit on the goods sold intracompany that have yet to be realized outside the group? Again, the adjustment is to credit the inventory. So make sure that you reduce the inventory by therefore removing the profit. And again, the, the, the adjustment to profit we've spoken about already earlier on. You debit the retained earnings, don't we? So that reduces the retained earnings of the seller. So remember, if S was the seller, it was working too, wasn't it? The net assets. Remember, it's the net assets at the reporting date. And then if P is the seller, you're just working five. OK. Uh, again, something that I think we've seen once in F7 way back. I, I can't recollect it being seen in P2. 
but that's going through there and looking at a pop for a non-current asset okay uh, again nice and simple if you've transferred a non-current asset for, from one entity to the other whether it's the parent to the sub the sub to the parent again we will need a, to essentially to remove the profit on disposal okay so you can work out the profit on disposal based upon proceeds less the carrying value at the date of disposal so you credit the property planted equipment by reducing the ppe and again you debit the retained earnings of the seller and, and the same rules apply if s is the seller you were just working two at the reporting date and if p is the seller you were just working number five because that is where we see the parents retained earnings isn't it okay uh, the next bit is vitally, vitally, vitally important. Looking at your, your fair value adjustments, okay? Uh, because what you've got to do is you need to put the fair value of the assets and the liabilities of the subsidiary on the group SFP. So we've commonly seen it with regards to property, plant and equipment, haven't we? We will be told what the fair value is at the acquisition date. We know, therefore, that that is unlikely to have changed unless we're told otherwise at the reporting date. But you then need to adjust, don't you, for any depreciation on that fair value adjustment. So we'll see that in one of the later examples. The one that I will point you out and, and just target at the moment is one that I think we've seen crop up more and more within P2 is, is your contingent liabilities. OK, uh, if you've got a contingent liability, in the individual accounts, so based on IS 37 uh, provisions, contingent liabilities and contingent assets, what's the accounting treatment for a contingent liability? Can you remember what do we do if we have a contingent liability? In the individual accounts, do we record it? No, we don't. We only record it if there's a probable outflow of economic benefit. Uh, we can measure that outflow of economic benefit reliably and we have an obligation. OK, a present obligation, isn't it? And that's when it became a provision, wasn't it? So we record a provision, but we don't record a contingent liability, do we? Contingent liabilities are disclosed within the notes of the account. So you bought this subsidiary and, and in all the, the rubbish, right at the back of the annual report is a contingent liability. And it's a massive contingent liability. Uh, so it could arise, but you're just not too sure of it within the subsidiary's account. So if you were to acquire that subsidiary, because of the uncertainty surrounding that contingent liability, what you would do as an investor, you would potentially pay less for that subsidiary, wouldn't you? you know, if there's a potential liability lying around the corner that you can read about, it's just not being recorded in the financial statements because of some wacky accounting rules, you're going to pay a little bit less. OK, so if that's the case, what we need to do within the group accounts, and that's the key bit, the group accounts and the group accounts only, what we will do is we will actually record the contingent liability to, to, if you like, reduce the value of the net assets acquired to bring it in line with, with the lower payment that we've made to buy the subsidiary. OK, so what we need to do is a contingent liability in the group accounts and within the group accounts only, we record that contingent liability. So we record it as S is net assets at the SFP date uh, and at the acquisition column. OK. Uh, again, just be careful because it is a contingent liability. A contingent liability reduces the net assets. OK. So when you're showing it within the net assets calculation of working two, you put it in brackets. OK. Yeah, like you do with your additional depreciation adjustment. So you adjust S as net asset to the SFP and at the acquisition column. Uh, just note that if anything changes, if there is extra depreciation, if you have sold the inventory, so that fair value adjustment is no longer required, make sure that you update S as net asset at the acquisition column for any changes that there may be. Okay, so, so do just be aware of that. The key one, is clearly PPE and the extra depreciation, but just have an awareness of that contingent liability and how the treatment is different from the group accounts to what you see within the individual subsidiary accounts. OK, it is a group account adjustment only. OK, 
Uh, other issues that we can go through and just touch upon uh, it is looking at the cost of the investments. Uh, so essentially what you've paid, because remember what you've got there is that you are going to debit the investment here. It's all about what you credit and also as well how much. So remember we're looking at this, aren't we? in p-books okay uh so you've got two choices uh you've got your cost of investment in terms of cash you've got your cost of investment there in terms of the shares okay uh so cash is essentially looking at the number of shares that you've bought multiplied by the price paid per share isn't it okay so looking at the price paid per share that you have acquired in terms of cash now you would credit bank debit the investment okay uh just be careful if you have, is it there, your deferred or your contingent cost of the investment in terms of how much you pay in cash. Uh, your deferred consideration is there at present value. So you will credit deferred consideration. And don't forget then to unwind that discount by charging an interest on that liability. And if it is contingent, uh, it doesn't matter about whether or not you think you are going to meet the criteria. Because what you do, you take account of that contingent consideration at fair value. Okay, so whatever the fair value of the contingent consideration is, that is what you use to record your goodwill. Okay, so you debit the investment, credit contingent consideration, and that will be at fair value. Okay, again, the fair value will be given to you. Uh, the deferred consideration at present value, you may have to discount it back by a year or two, but, but nothing too excessive. If it's there with regards to shares, you've got four steps, isn't it? You know, when you're looking there at your shares, specifically what you're doing is you are debiting the investment, aren't we? Here, we're going to credit share capital and then credit your share premium, okay? Uh, so in order to do that, you have to follow four steps. Step one, two, three, four. Okay. Uh, so to do that, you need to look at the number of shares that you've acquired. So if you've bought 80% of a subsidiary, you've bought 80% of S's shares. Uh, so if it was a million, you've bought 80, 800,000, haven't we? 80% of the million. Uh, you then have the number of P shares issued. So one for two, two for three, two for five. So you need to take the number of S shares acquired and adjust then for the number of P shares issued. And then you value those P shares issued at P share price. Okay, P share price will then go through that using the number of shares of P that have been issued will give you the debit to the investment. And then it's that debit to the investment that you see, isn't it, in working number three. Okay. Uh, and then you record the share issue. So essentially recording the share issue, oh, pardon me, careful, is whereby you credit share capital and credit share premium. Okay. Uh, so remember, you credit share capital at the par value and then you credit share premium, don't we, with, with, with the balancing figure, the difference between the debit to the investment and the credit to the share capital. So the credit to the share capital takes the number of P shares that you've issued and multiplies it by the par value, doesn't it? Usually a dollar, okay? Uh, other tiny little bits and pieces just to go through there and finish things up. Uh, not a lot to really get as excited about. Uh, Mid-year acquisitions. Uh, again, if you've got a mid-year acquisition with regards to the group statement of financial position, you just assume that the profits accrue evenly in the year and you just adjust the retained earnings. So you take the retained earnings at the year end uh, and remove the post acquisition profits or take the retained earnings at the start of the year and then add on the profits up to the date of acquisition. OK, having prorated the profit for the year. Uh, other bits, uniform accounting policies. Uh, so the subsidiary must adopt the parent accounting policies. Uh, just have a knowledge of it. I don't think you're likely to see that numerically. Uh, so if one your parent has, if you like, depreciation based upon straight line, the subsidiaries is reducing balance, you would need to adjust 
the subsidiaries to bring it in line with the parents. Okay, uh, and any adjustments, any differences that you calculate get thrown through at working number two and the net assets of the sub. Okay, uh, co terminus year ends. What do we have there? Uh, well, the key bit there is that three months is the key. So, uh, if it's within three months of the year end, you don't need to prepare any updated financial statements. Uh, however, if it is within three years, the, the, oh, sorry, three months, uh, oh, sorry, if it is after three months, you would need to adjust your financial statements. Okay. Uh, and then the option uh, for, for non consolidation uh, scenarios that tend to arise within the exams tend to focus on the fact that the director doesn't want to consolidate the subsidiary probably because it's loss making and that reduces the results for the year doesn't it it looks bad on the position and the performance so the only time that you can not consolidate is if it is held for sale so you are looking to dispose of that subsidiary and it has met the criteria of ifrs5 as a disposal group held for sale or if therefore you cannot exercise control okay so if you do not control it then you do not consolidate it okay you you, you can't con not consolidate it just because it is loss making okay there we go uh, so again that might be useful for, for a non-computational aspect of discursive elements uh, before we look at that big example in the next video because uh, you may wish to take a break after this pretty lengthy session talking about the workings uh, and the adjustments uh, you've got the, the adjustments between the group and the associate. Okay. Uh, so if you have trading transactions, receivables, payables, do not eliminate the balances. Okay. Uh, because uh, what's happened there is that, you know, we haven't consolidated the subsidiary, have we? So there's no need to, to remove those balances. Okay. You've only put the associate in as, as one line item. Sorry. I think I may have said subsidiary, didn't I? But you know what I mean. Uh, if we have an associate, we haven't consolidated the associate. So that there's no need to eliminate the balances line by line. It's just one line item, isn't it? Okay. Not very exciting. Uh, unrealized profit. The key bit that you've got there is that you adjust, is it for P share of any provision for unrealized profit? Okay. If that's the case, what you do is that you will just go through and debit the retained earnings of the group is it there in working number five uh, the credit or the pens uh, if you've gone the parent to the associate or is it the associate to the parent okay the credit entry or the pens upon the direction of sale because if p has sold to a then a has the inventory if a has sold to p then p has the inventory okay so in that second situation, that's quite handy because if P has the inventory, we have consolidated the parent's results, so we can credit the inventory. Okay, so we can go through that and reduce the inventory. Okay, however, if A has the inventory, we haven't consolidated the associate, have we? So therefore, we can't credit the inventory. If that's the case, what we need to go through and do that is we have to credit something to do with the associate. So you will credit your investment in associates. Okay, so if you like your, your standardized working six. So the key issue to think about there is we will always debit the retained earnings of the group in working number five. That does not change because it is the, the group that has the influence. The issue is whereabouts the credit entry is made. And that credit entry adjustment depends upon who has the inventory. If the parent has the inventory, we can credit inventory. If the associate has the inventory, we have to credit something to do with the associate. And the only thing we can credit on the SFP with the associate is the investment and associate line, isn't it? Okay. So there we go. Uh, we're going to stop it now. Uh, we're going to go through and give yourself a chance maybe to take a break. Maybe to just go through there and just revise again uh, some of the adjustments. Maybe have a look at the study text if you so wish of whatever tuition provider you've chosen. Or alternatively, you can think, well, right, I'm, I'm reasonably happy with it. I'll get the practice uh, as I do the questions and that will supplement my understanding and we'll go straight into the example. It's entirely up to you. Whatever you so wish, do just make sure that at the end you're happy with the example that we're about to look at.
So I'll see you all in a few minutes.